the places I didn't enjoy environmentally, the places that were just not working for me were the ones that were really homogenized because they were always very, very white and they were always very, very isolated. And they kind of had a self-justifying structure and an other dismissing and diminishing structure. And that did not jive with the way I grew up or, or the values that I wanted to carry through life. So that was something I definitely rebelled against. That was singer Tara de Mulan. I'm Jeff. And this is Storied San Francisco. In this podcast, Tara traces her story back to the panhandle in the late 1980s. Her mom passed away when Tara was very young, so she left San Francisco to live with her grandfather in Maine. She talks about visits to New York City she took as a kid, and how Broadway and the excitement of the big city left a strong impression on her. From there, Tara went with her grandpa to Fort Worth, Texas. And then she finished her school days in the white, rich L.A. suburb of La Cañada. Here's Tara. I will never say my story makes sense, but let's start with that. Why not? (laughs) Yeah, we'll try to keep it light. I did say earlier to a friend, um, trying to describe childhood in San Francisco in the late 80s without the chaos and abuse is kind of like trying to give a walking tour of North Beach and Chinatown to a group of Mormons. I can do it. I've done it, but it's kind of like, here's a church, there's a park, who wants ice cream, you know? That's that's basically what we're sticking with. Um, Yeah, it was an interesting time. I think, I wasn't sure what I was getting into when you suggested this, so I thought, God, I hope they don't want, like, some Pete Hamill New York nostalgia thing for San Francisco, because I don't know that I can do that the same way. Okay. Um, as some people can, because we all do have a little bit of that. Everybody who was born here, who grew up here, partly grew up here, um, has a little bit of that things were great when I was young and then everything went to hell feeling. It's true. We all do have a bit of that. Right. But the late 80s in San Francisco was a challenging time, and my mother who was, you said talk about your parents, my mother was a wonderful person, very fragile, wouldn't kill anything. We'd take Mm. walks in the panhandle to collect eucalyptus buttons so that we could shoo away the fleas or the ants or whatever naturally. Um, But she had a tough time in life. She was diagnosed with breast cancer when I was two and a half. Oh, wow. And she had a mastectomy and it had already spread to the other breast mm. and she had a mastectomy for the other breast mm-hmm. and it had already spread to her brain oh. so by the time she was 32 she had had a stroke and was in a wheelchair Jeez. and she died when i was six and she was 33. okay and before that we lived in the city and that's my memories of the city but she was on chemo and doing radiation treatments so and she was very weak and she was a single mom mm. so in those days On the upside, you could live in the hate in a railroad flat by Masonic and Oak for what you made at Captain Video. Wow. But, you know, on the downside, I was pouring my own cereal very young, walking to kindergarten by myself, by guys with needles in their arms and guys dying of AIDS, and it was a really strong image Mm -hmm. and a strong memory because... One of the few things PTSD does for you that can be advantageous if you're an artist is it gives you a very sharp memory. Right. Um, And you tend to hold on to a lot of memories from youth that when you talk to other people, they may not have. I talk to a lot of people who don't remember anything before five, and I think, oh my God, I remember so much before five, Um, just because of the context surrounding that time. You perhaps had Um, to take on a little more than a a normal three-year-old or yeah but I think also it was just such an interesting time to be alive the world was changing it was there was a lot of tectonic shifting artistically and politically um the Reagan years were rough for a lot of people but you know we were in San Francisco so we were just talking about how it can be this lovely little island the bubble bubble exactly Mm -hmm. and so I was going to school and preschool and kindergarten with um it was very diverse with people who didn't speak English at all, um, with people of every color of the rainbow. And it took a while longer for me to realize the way the rest of the country and the rest of the world was. 
Um, also something we were just talking about yeah, with my brief we're talking about time, with time, time away. In Montana. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you go, you don't even have to go that far. You know, you go Correct. 20, 30 miles in any direction and you'll end up somewhere where you're a little disturbed by how freely, how, what types of things people feel comfortable talking about and well, how and, and why they feel comfortable talking about those things. One of the ways I, w- I was describing to a friend recently, because we were talking about that, how, mm-hmm. you know, maybe you can go to Walnut Creek or something and you, and you see mm-hmm. a couple of Trump signs. And I was like, yes, that's something that I'm okay with. Montana was like, like we were the couple of other things that, yeah. but to your point and not my experience, to no, your point. absolutely. I mean, it just it's it been was that growing way up for in a, a bubble. Um, lots of chaos and lots of difficulty within that bubble, personally, privately, right? But um, do you know what brought your mom here? Vaguely, yeah. She got kicked out of the house at seventeen. From and where was that? My in um, Rochester. My grandfather was a senior VP of Kodak Professional. He had okay. worked his way up as a chemist in Kodak and made it to that, that role. So he was the guy that had his hands on the purse strings for the creative project. So he was surrounded by creative people. Um, but he had an affair with his secretary mm. and ended up leaving my grandmother for his secretary. Oh, dad, granddad. She had some, um, she, I believe, was bipolar. She had a lot of... This is your grandmother. Yes. Yeah. She had a lot of feelings. She was a genius. Absolute genius. She had studied to become an x-ray tech yeah. so that he could work his way through chemistry school to get to where he was at. Jeez. And I've seen... She left me a lot of things, and I saw her um, diagrams for the x-ray and her shorthand. She took shorthand, and she wow. did other jobs, too. She was an absolute genius. Um, and she just was profoundly, profoundly depressed. She never got over the divorce. Mm-hmm. And she holed herself away and became a bit of a hoarder. And mm. it was very sad, but she was just such a powerhouse intellectually. And for her to have the bravery to move from New York to San Francisco because her best friend lived in Burlingame, my mother wanted to be close to her mother. After she got kicked out of the house by the, the stepmother, um, she decided, I guess I'll go to California. So she came to San Francisco. She was too young to be a hippie, and she always regretted never going to Woodstock. So oh, man. She loved being here. Do you and, know if she um, had ever visited even, or if she's just like, I got people I there? I don't know. Kind of thing. Yeah. I don't know yeah. that. Yeah. Um, she may have visited my mother, my grandmother, before she came out. Okay. But she came out here and had a variety of interesting, colorful jobs. And she worked as a waitress at Cobb's Comedy Club. And my father yes. was a comedian at Cobb's Comedy Club Holy in the 80s. Holy shit, the things you don't know. Used to play Holy City Zoo and used to play yes. Cobb's. And when Robin Williams was on the Ascendancy, the 80s, one of the great things about the 80s in San Francisco comedy. was the comedy renaissance. Out of control. The UK is now going through the kind of comedy renaissance San Francisco had in the 80s. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Um, what was your father's name? Len Pardo. Okay. And he was a uh, sort of targeted one night stand. My mother saw him and thought her best friend was also a waitress at Cobb's and was pregnant. She didn't really have the resources or any kind of structure to have a family, but just thought, I really want a baby. And oh. she saw him and she thought, yeah, okay. Damn, that, that, that is, works. That's precision. She slept with him one time. It wasn't just like you're hot. I want to bang you. It's like day, to this day, whenever I talk to my father, whenever I think of my mother, I just think, what is the textbook definition of a miracle of like one in a two billion right. shot or whatever <laughs> right. it is that brought me into existence? I still just mystify. Holy moly! If you saw both of them together, which I only ever did, I think one time for any length of time. You just think, how on earth did that happen? But it did, and here I am. And so you're was, a product yeah. of sh- stage life, show business. I think I'm a, a product of a deep desire for something meaningful. I think she wanted something meaningful. She wanted a greater kind of love. She was a very sensitive, fragile person, and that is the kind of love she wanted in her life, and she sought it out. And I'm really, really grateful she did because we both gave each other something no one else could give either one of us right that's i love that wow so your dad do you know what his story of be either you know being born here or coming no he to grew be up here? in lock haven pennsylvania lock he haven. went back he's he's there now okay um he came out probably because of the records that he was listening to i got to know him later in life i got to know him as a teenager and um and a young adult and we have sort of a friendly we're you know, friends, we're 
acquaintance friends, but we were never really very close. But, you know, I love him. He's a great guy. Yeah. Um, also very brilliant. <laughs> also sometimes struggles getting out of his own way, but very, very smart and very funny and um, musical, which I didn't know until I was older. Okay. So we've bonded on that. We tend, he loves silent films, and I love silent films. He loves classical and jazz, and I love classical and jazz. So we get to talk about some things that I don't get to talk to everybody about, which is nice. Right on. Um, but yeah, the it was an interesting time growing up um, because of who was present or who wasn't. He wanted to be present. She didn't want him to be, and she only told him that he was my father when she found out she was dying of cancer. Okay. And then, so he was still around in those days. He was still around, in SF. yeah, here okay. and here and there. Okay. Um, and then I ended up moving outside the Bay Area shortly after she died. So then we lost touch for many years. Okay. Yeah. What uh, do you want to talk about? Where you went and, and who you were with and that kind of thing. Well, let's do a brief overview because we want to keep this light. Um, yeah, it's kind of a trundling caravan of crazy for most of those years. But I went to Maine. I stayed in New York briefly in between times in Maine, um, Texas, Southern California. And the decision to come back happened in Southern California. Okay. Because it was 2002, and I had been in college, and wasn't really for me. I think I studied yoga, tango, archery, and foreign language. Shit. Um, I sang with Donald Brinegar, though, so that was really worth college. That really okay. made the whole experience. If you can sing with Donald Brinegar, it's worth any experience. <laughs> totally. Can I ask real fast, where in Texas? Uh, Fort Worth. That's where I'm from. What no the? way. Why I never you, knew you were from why were Fort you there? Worth. I was there because my grandfather got married to a woman who lived there, and one day over dinner, he just said, we're moving to Texas. And I thought, okay. okay. Wait, same grandfather? Your mom's? My mom's father. Father, the same one. He, okay. The, from the earlier short this. version of this is there was already a lot of chaos and abuse before my mother died, but after she died, there was kind of, that kind of hit an oil patch, and there was a great deal of it, and my grandfather got tipped off. And the way that he describes it is, we were done raising children. Okay. Um, but he had gotten divorced from a second wife. He took me when he um, moved to Maine to be the CEO of the Center for Creative Imaging, oh, wow. which was a digital media company that would teach print photographers how to transition to digital. He okay. was way ahead of the curve. He was the one that was telling Kodak, you need to get into digital. And they didn't listen to was him, and he bailed. Still the late 80s or early 90s No, this or so? would have been, yeah, this would have been the, probably he was talking about that in the late 80s, but it was the early 90s. Wow. I moved with him, I think, in 1990 or 91. Okay. And we lived in Maine for a couple of years, and I loved it there. And then one day he, and we'd go to New York for, you know, professional photography shows or whatever other. To the city, not Rochester. Things. Yes, no, to the city. To the city, to the got, city. It. got it, got it. Always Manhattan, and of course, I was obsessed with Broadway. I, yeah, and let's so talk about it that. It was the golden age of Broadway. Oh, God, I could talk about that forever. The 1990s was the last, to me, and to many of us who grew up as ex the last great golden age of Broadway. Okay. You had so many incredible performers. Bernadette Peters was still mm. everywhere. Glenn Close and Sunset Boulevard. Mm -hmm. You know... Oh my God, I can't even, Maury Eston's Titanic, to this day, I will go on and on and on about Maury Eston's Titanic because everyone thinks it's the James Cameron film. Uh oh. And the score is just stunning. And How old were you when you were doing that? Oh God, very young. I think the first Broadway show I ever saw, I was probably seven or eight. Okay. And it was The Secret Garden with Rebecca Luker, who just passed away, okay. as the original Lily, and Mandy Patinkin, mm. and John Cameron Mitchell, who went on to be Hedwig, mm -hmm. and Hedwig and the Angry Inch was Dickon. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I got to see some legendary performances. I'm very, very lucky. Is that kind of um, one of your bigger impressions, or maybe your biggest impression of like being young and going to New York was the shows? Yes. Wait, what else about the, the city? The excitement. Oh, yeah. God, everything. Yeah. Oh, the smell. Yes. You'll kn that smell of Sabret's hot dogs and the sounds and the, you know, the wafting up from the From the subway. subway. Absolutely. I mean, New York was so much, as much woven into the fabric of who I was as San Francisco. Chinatown in San Francisco has a whole unique series of smells of its own. One of my favorite moments 
was giving a walking tour because I wasn't lying earlier. I did walking walking tours in (laughs) in Chinatown, and I had to do a few of them to some very wholesome people. It's an autobiographical joke. All the brothels, edit out all the bar stories, (laughs) all the murders, all the Barbary Coast stuff, and you've got a church, a park, and some ice cream. Um, Yes, but one of my favorite moments was we saw a hawk pick a pigeon out of midair. And scare everybody. And then we had some other bird-related thing. And the third bird-related thing on the same walking tour was um, a few seagulls battling over the bucket of innards that they put out. And one of them got hold of a ribbon of innards that went about three feet, and the other one was fighting him for it. And so the one, in order to get one up on the other guy, just tilted his head back and gobbled the entire thing. Three feet of massive cow innards or whatever it was. And one of the Belgian women <laughs> that was on the tour says, my God, he is going to kill himself. He is going to give himself indigestion. The other seagull grabbed the two or three inches that were left out of the other seagull's mouth and ripped about a foot back out. And every one of the tourists was just standing there. And to me, that's its own thing. That's, that's San Francisco Chi- Chinatown yeah. is its own thing. LA's Chinatown is its own thing. Yeah. New York's Chinatown. but. The smell of New York, the excitement yeah. of New York, the everybody being there to recognize some kind of ambition or some kind of identity or some achievement, that throbbing, pulsating liveliness and focus and energy. I mean, it's, it's like hearing a drum solo that every time you hear it, it kind of reminds you what you want to do with your life. And that kind of, that's the way New York feels to me. But I when like I was it. a kid, it was just... Being in the moment and movement and life and movement at the pace that I was comfortable at. Okay. You know? And that felt very exciting, especially with the music. Okay. And Broadway with the scores and the symphonic music in those days. I mean, we were just so spoiled, so lucky to grow up when we grew up. So Texas might, must have been quite a contrast. Texas was a contrast, but Casa Manana Theater. Oh, yeah. I grew up uh, going to field Kimball trips there. Art Museum. Yeah, absolutely. There is culture in Texas. We forget. Absolutely. You know, we tend to be really snooty in San Francisco. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily saying that's where you were going, but I'm just saying we do tend to dismiss what we call flyover country, right? But Fort Worth is Fort is Worth. Big. Yes. Casa Manana. Billy Rose started the Casa Manana yeah. when he was married to Fanny Bryce, I think. And, um, yeah, so there was still a lot of music. Mm-hmm. I think I saw my first production of Fiddler on the Roof there. Oh. And See, that's getting close to home because my mom's Jewish and my oh, yeah? grandparents are Jewish and like they would go to productions of yeah, Fiddler on the Roof right? at Casa we Mignana. We might have gone to the same production of Fiddler I on the Roof. I wasn't there because I was too cool for school. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I see how and it is. And slightly older than you. but um, They did nonsense as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my parents could have been at some of those shows that you were at in the 90s, right? They might have right? been, yeah, yeah, 90s, yeah. mid-90s yeah, in Texas. I love it. Yeah. Texas had its moments. Again, Texas is great. If, because Southern hospitality is real, Absolutely. if, if yeah. you don't belong to any of the groups that are termed as other. Right. And this was before I was overtly political. I mean, I've been politically aware and involved and invested since I was young. Mm-hmm. My mom took me into the voting booth and I punched Dukakis. Yes. You know, when I was, yes. I don't know, five. I think I, I, I did don't too. Right? Right. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, see, we're excited. We're, we're both the same generation. Maybe, maybe an election about. ahead of that, but yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay, it's all right. But, um, but, you know, I grew up in San Francisco, and I was transplanted to Maine, which was all white people. Mm-hmm. Very different from the way I grew up mm-hmm. when I was growing up. I was one of two or three white kids in my school, and it right. just that was our normal, and it just wasn't right. a thing. Right. And then suddenly you're surrounded by this kind of homogenized culture and it was really a shock Mm -hmm. and there wasn't any of the flavor and differences and conversations that I had had when for example we were talking to my gay godfathers or you know my godmother was this wonderful Filipino woman that would talk about racism and would talk about real life and there wasn't a lot of talk about real life in Maine it was a beautiful place lots of nature stunning but that just wasn't part of the world there at the time and then you know new york had that so maybe that's why it felt more like home right um texas also was very segregated there was so much racism and i was just so blind to so much of it because i was just too young and a white girl so it just didn't occur until you know you'd make friends with people and you'd hear the things that were said at home Mm -hmm. 
you know. And it but was, their theater is called Casa Manana. I'm like, yeah, Casa Manana. Come on, you guys. would think, right? Yeah. So there was that. So you know, when you see how quote unquote other is treated, that's really scary. And it also yeah. kind of it trains you to behave a certain way, hmm. not to buy into it because if you're your mother's daughter and you believe that everybody's equal and and good and everything and you believe everybody is equally human then you can't buy into that part of it but you start paying attention to things that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise paid attention to and that was kind of texas was a learning experience on a lot of levels but it really prepared me i think for bush and trump administrations because i got to know all the really good-hearted people all the hospitable people all the people who would be right there for you in a crisis who also could say and do some really callous things and it's right. it's hard for us here in the bubble yeah. to reconcile that sometimes absolutely like it's too easy to monsterize to to become the monster you're fighting right you know totally. we say we don't want to be that we don't like people who treat others as less than but then it's too easy to say well this is what these people are this is they're just cold they're just cruel right that's not really true you see that and then but that's really hard to reconcile too like how do you deal with these attitudes and totally. these, these scenarios that would unfold as part of life when you have no power in your 11 12 13 right and you want to stick up for your friends and you try to but you have no power so there was that, and that okay. was an interesting thing. And that kind of launched me after Bush defeated Ann Richards. In 94, I believe it was. I don't actually remember, so well done on that. Yeah, yeah for the governorship, <clears throat> yes. which blew all of our minds who were paying attention. My grandfather was a staunch Republican. He was thrilled. But for some of us who weren't, the idea that the, the propaganda around it was like, oh, she would just say flat out he's not qualified. Mm -hmm. They'd say, oh, she's just, she's being so mean. Can you mm -hmm. believe right. Can you believe oh, what she's saying about poor George W. Bush? If only that's all they said now. Oh, oh yeah, they care about person. civility until... Totally. Yeah, nobody can say anything about civility after the last five years. So you were in, in Texas in 94. Um, yes, I was and, in... Well, let me think. Starting yes, four, to be five, and six. Like four, five, and six. A, um, a kind of like a barely teenager or so? I left... When I was 13, so yes. Got it. And so where did, 10, 11, 12. Okay. Where did y'all yeah. go from there? I went to Southern California. Okay. Um, my uncle had promised my mother he would take care of me, and he decided the time to do that was when he and his young wife had were just, she was pregnant with their first child, and so they brought me as a 13-year-old out to Southern California. They brought a babysitter in is what they brought. <laughs> yeah. They actually gave me a one-inch thick, bound with ribbons, um, stack of papers of all the things I was going to do for them. And the last Whoa. page, yeah, I was going to clean the house. I was going to babysit the, the baby, God all these things. Damn. The last page was what they were going to do for me. And it was, you know, we're going to feed her, clothe her, send her to school. I chucked uh, it in the trash. And that pretty much started my relationship with my aunt and uncle, which to this okay. day is pretty much non-existent. But, Yikes. you know, we there have been a lot of, there are a lot of stories there. But Southern these California as a young woman, not my first choice. Right. Absolutely blood red rage that I had to live there. Yeah. These are formative years, so I'm curious where in Southern California. La Cañada. Where's that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like what what is it close to? What is it or? close to? <laughs> um it is a very, very and it's actually getting better. Oh my god, there is actually a page on Facebook that says Something to the effect of LC alums for, um, I don't know, awareness of, of other people. I other people. Other, other people. humans. It was a very, very, in the time I lived there, it was a very, very, very white Christian affluent Republican place. And again, not saying necessarily there's anything wrong with that. It just shouldn't jive with who I was. Right. Um, so... Homogeny, which you, you homogeny, mentioned earlier. Exactly. Yeah, homogeny. Yeah, yeah. I think that is something that I have never, ever until this moment thought of. But right. the places I didn't enjoy environmentally, the places that were just not working for me, were the ones that were really homogenized because yeah. they were always very, very white and they were always very, very isolated. And they kind of had a self justifying structure yeah. and an other dismissing mm -hmm. and diminishing structure. Mm -hmm. And that did not jive with the way I grew up or, or the values that I wanted to carry through life. So that was something I definitely rebelled against, most notably in La Cañada, because 
we don't we didn't have the term Karen in those days. <laughs> and, we didn't and work Karen. I don't know what what is it a Chad or a Todd or something? What's a male Todd, Karen? I go a, with Todd, t- a Todd. Todd. Let's go with Todd. Okay, I think it's a Chad, but it might be a Todd. I don't know. Whatever the the J Crew. Yeah. That was very much what it was. La Cañada is kind of situated around Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena. Okay, okay. Not really, but close by. The most famous things in La Cañada are JPL and Descanso Gardens. Okay. Yeah. Um, Jet Propulsion Lab. Jet Propulsion Lab, yeah. Where they which was right make up rockets. The, yeah, which was right up the hill from my high school, which was La Cañada High School, which at the okay. time was a blue, blue ribbon school and... Mm. Um, but I had gone to a private school in Texas, so the curriculum we were studying when I was, I don't know, what would it have been, eighth grade, ninth grade, was what I had studied as, in fifth grade in Texas. I'm scared to ask which private school you went to in Fort Worth. Oh, God. Well, Con- Fort Worth Country Academy. Day? No, Fort Worth Country Academy. Day. God, I remember Country Day. Yeah. God, this is I'm crazy. I'm a public no school cares. kid. I'm like, <laughs> we were like, what are those kids in private school doing? Fort Worth Academy. Yeah. Fort it was Academy it was too. wonderful. Okay. I got the best education of my life awesome. there, too. Texas's credit. Rad. That's another assumption a lot of people in the, you know, New York, San Francisco sphere Coast, make of yeah. the South right. is that you're not going to get a good education there. That is definitely not true. Certainly other public schools, best education of my life. Absolutely right wonderful. On. Right on. But you come out to Southern California and it's very, the value system's very superficial. And yeah. especially if you're a 13 year old girl, I moved into an area where, you know, I was, I didn't appreciate at the time that bold confidence was something that would make a very strong impression where I came into mm-hmm. that place, when I came into that place. Mm-hmm. Um, because nobody in that town was immune from the what does everybody think of me right. disease. Yeah. And I had never had that problem. <laughs> yeah. Mainly because I had moved almost every year since, since my mother had died. So I was always the new kid. You know, I wasn't emotionally invested in what other people thought of me. Right. And... Yeah, I guess it just authenticity was really rare in the in that time for the that age range and that place, and um, to this day I still get a lot of messages from people I grew up with who I barely had any contact with saying, you know, you made such an impression on me because you just were who you were and and we didn't realize that was an option. They didn't recognize it then, but they know. Was really yeah. powerful and and made me rethink everything and awesome. changed changed something for me. So that was really special. Yeah. It's never so too again, late. sometimes it's the St. Francis simple prayer thing, you know, Lord, let me be an instrument of your peace. Sometimes when you move into a place or something happens that you don't like, t- turn of events happens that you feel doesn't favor you or that you wouldn't choose for yourself and that you feel is even something you're really averse to or enraged about. <laughs> sometimes you're there as a service in that role like sometimes you do learn a great thing for yourself to carry but sometimes you're there not for you yeah it's like when bad things happen it's like okay what are you going to do with that right because i do not believe i think one of the lines in life that makes me more bristly than anything is the everything happens for a reason line but i do believe that if you walk outside and look at a stucco building, you'll see a face eventually. You know, human beings, human brains recognize patterns. Totally. So if you can find pattern and purpose in something, especially in something that is painful or tragic, great. You know, if you can give something a pattern or purpose, and if you can take a lesson away from it that makes you better, great. That was Tara de Mula. On the next episode of Story San Francisco, Tara will tell us all about her return to her hometown. Look for part two this Thursday. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season, we have more than 150 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can, subscribe, rate, and review our show so we can reach even more folks. And if you'd like to drop us an old-fashioned email, we'd love that. The address is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay safe, stay strong, stay healthy. And we'll see you next time. This podcast 
Podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM Podcast Network. Learn more at podcast.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.